Welcome to the Seesaw Project. I'm Chris Dahlquist coming from Kansas City, Missouri. I'd like to be the first to welcome you here. If it's your first time at the Seesaw Project, let me tell you a little bit about it. Uh, Seesaw Project is a playground for the chronically curious, uh, created by three working artists from across the country that found this summer when we didn't have any shows that we missed so desperately being together with our fellow artists and art collectors like you. So we created the Seesaw Project to have a place to come together to chat and be inspired by one another and by you. Um, I'd like to introduce you to my artwork, Max. Can... So I'm a photographer uh, that blends historic photographic process with contemporary technology to create works of fiction that are based on true stories. Um, and speaking of artists that inspire me, I'd love to start introducing you to my partners in crime here at the Seesaw Project. First off, let me introduce you uh, to the ever-inspiring Miss Kina Crow. Hi! Hi, Chris! Hi, everybody! Thank you so much for coming. I'm Kina Crow. I am a mixed media artist and sculptor um, and animal lover living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, Max, can you show my work? That's me. That's what I make. And I'm really, really excited for this particular episode be, because um, our gracious, wonderful friend, uh, John Whipple, is going to amaze us. Um, and you might need a hanky. This is the most beautiful video. We got to see it yesterday, but um, I'm super excited uh, to to let everybody see that. And uh, it's time to introduce you to our third leg, our third, the third wing, I guess I should say, um, Ms. Beth Bajarski. Hi, Beth. Hi, everyone. Hi, Kina. Hi, Chris. Hi, I'm Beth Wojarski. I'm here in a 45 degree Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I'm cold. Um, <laughs> uh, oil. I'm an oil painter. And if Max would pop a picture up. Oh, my God. I love okay, so we've got a picture of one of my paintings, but we also have a picture of the birthday boy. Today is Mark Winter's birthday. Oh no, I didn't know that. Uh, Happy birthday, Mark. Happy birthday, Mark. Just want to send out birthday wishes to him. Um, thanks for joining us. Uh, just a reminder before we get into tonight's episode, we love hearing from you. Um, if you have burning questions or comments for us um, or our featured artist, John Whipple, post them in the comment section. If you like clicking on buttons, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel um, or like our Seesaw Project on Facebook. I want to introduce a guy who can't get enough of the yacht rock, getting it all done behind the scenes, our producer, Max Crow. Hi, Max. Hi everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I've been <through> yet. <laughs> um, Besides Max, there's helpers behind the scenes putting links to the artists that you will see featured in tonight's episode. So those links will be in the comment section. Watch for that. Now just sit back and relax and enjoy your cocktail. As a reminder of how to make tonight's cocktail pairing, here's our good friend, writer and editor, Steph Keelan with the Whipple Tipple. Hello, virtual drinking buddies. It's Steph Keelan with this week's Seesaw Project cocktail pairing. This week's featured artist is John Whipple. John is a brown liquor kind of guy, which is great because brown liquor is now in season because it's fall. But John lives in Florida, and fall is not quite the same thing there as it is here in the Midwest, so we're going to add a little sunshine to it. I call this the Whipple Tipple. For this drink, we need two ounces of bourbon, an orange slice, orange bitters, and rhubarb syrup. If you don't have a secret stash of rhubarb in your freezer like I do, you can use ginger. So, uh, for this, you throw in the orange. Put in your bitters, oops, I like quite a bit, and then toss in the syrup. Then you get to get your frustrations out with the muddler, and you smash, oops, smash that up until the orange is all nice and smooshy down there. Throw in the ice, 
couple of handfuls like this, throw the bourbon over it, and then give that a good stir because you want all the stuff that's on the bottom to get up there and dance with the bourbon, and you are ready to tipple away. So, cheers, John, and all y'all. May the sunshine find you wherever you are. Wow. I love it. I love it. Uh, and loves Def in her yellow sweater. We could use some of her sunshine here in Kansas City, too. Uh, so if uh, John is uh, finished making his cocktail, I would like to uh, inter introduce John Whipple and have him join us uh, for the remainder of the show. Uh, welcome our good friend, John Whipple. Cheers, everyone. Oh, cheers. Cheers. So good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Cheers. So we brought John in so that we could grill him like a cheese sandwich. Um, but first, we uh, are going to go to our Ask, uh, Ask a Collector segment. And last week, uh, I believe our question was, do you have any artist-made textiles? And if so, who made them? And these are some of the um, answers that we got from uh, people who posted on Facebook. Uh, Jolene Dames, uh, an artist friend of mine, sent in this, uh, her favorite cashmere sweater by Annie Turban. Looks gorgeous on her. And a beautiful quilt by Amy Alstrom that was um, sent in by Audrey. And oh, Meredith Host with these fantastic, fantastic towels. Um, God, they're gorgeous. I want one of those. <laughs> and then Shannon Owen, who makes um, felt, it's felted jewelry um, and, and other objects, other interesting objects. So thank you guys so much um, for sending that in. Yes. Um, <laughs> I'm excited about um, Meredith Host. Y'all have seen Meredith's work before. She's a ceramicist that I am usually drinking out of, and she just um, introduced those textiles this week. I love her designs. They're uh, cool. Right? They're really fun. I do. I want some of those. <laughs> Me too. Thank you for everyone who submitted um, an image uh, of their textiles. We have a question for next week. Uh, next week's question that we're gonna ask a collector is, do you have any found art and where did you find it? Now, the question was inspired by a short video that was sent to us by a friend of ours, Benjamin Beamer, he's in Oregon. And if we could play that. Hi everybody, I'm Benjamin Beamer and I wanna show you my John Whipple. Well, I got two. We used to go to dinner a lot. And you know, sometimes they give you crayons and butcher paper. So this one's called Thought Bubble. And then sometimes Sharpies just come out and the backs of plates could get decorated. Anyway, thought you might enjoy. <laughs> Thank you, Patchamon. Do you remember that, John? <laughs> um, I know Ben's out there and I'm just telling you, Ben, there's that fine line between found and stolen. <laughs> <laughs> very fine line. <laughs> nice. Well, sometimes you come across artwork, you find it. Um, it's spontaneous, like that piece that John created on the uh, um, the paper at the restaurant. Um, my piece, it was a piece of found artwork. Um, got a little helper here. Let's see. <laughs> Let me just tilt that. Uh, found a velvet Michael Jackson um, on the side of the road. So that's one of them. And thank you, Mark. Thank you, birthday boy. And my other one, um, I just did this really quick. I have two. I hope everyone doesn't mind. But okay, so listen. I found this crochet a doll. <laughs> um, he's a lion tamer. I don't know how to crochet. If anyone out there knows how to crochet and would like to build me this lion tamer, I would be so grateful and we could, you know, work something out, if you know what I mean. But looking for someone who knows to crochet a lion tamer. Um, Chris, what about you? What's your found art? 
Well, I got to say that uh, Ben might not be the only one that sneaks back into the restaurant <laughs> to tear the paper off the table. Max, can you show? Oh. <laughs> So we've got a great restaurant uh, down the street from us that's got butcher paper on the table. Uh, and when all the artists are in town, we go down there for breakfast and uh, I ask them to keep the paper after we leave. So I've got a few pieces uh, of both Lynn and John, people, other people on the show perhaps um, that have stolen, stolen from the breakfast table at Happy <laughs> Gills. <laughs> So thank you, John. That is one of my prized pieces of found art. <laughs> what and about I, you, John? Do you have well, found art? Yeah, this one is funny. And if I, if I would have known this is well before the selfie stick, but this is our selfie stick. I don't know if you can see it. It, it, it was a uh, probably an aspen, like an eye in one, but it looked like a little mouth. And then we would just go around and... <laughs> 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 That's awesome. Perfect. <laughs> this is a, a selfie stick back before selfie sticks. <laughs> we would have well, known that we would be rich. I oh, <laughs> it's not too late. It's not too late. It's not too late. <laughs> um, well, mine, my, mine is actually nature made as well, and I had a tree fall on um, the roof of my studio last spring. And I went out and there was this really weird, oop, here, I got to figure out how to hold it up. This really weird and absolutely beautiful thing, which I thought was a piece of lichen, but it looks like a piece of ceramic art to me. And it turns out it's a mushroom. It's a turkey tail mushroom. And it's like, it's hard. It's like hard, like a piece of wood. But anyway, I have it on a shelf in the bar. <laughs> so we could just, we display this funny little thing. Um, yeah. Cause it looks like clay. I almost might want to try and make something like that um, out of clay. But speaking of ceramics, we have a really exciting uh, video to show you courtesy of the Cleveland Institute of art for our segment seesaw surfs the web. Um, it's uh, Kevin Snipes, a ceramic artist from, I believe he he was residing here in Pittsburgh for a while, um, but now I think he's in Philadelphia. And I hope you guys enjoy this because we thought it was really cool. I'm Kevin Snipes and I'm a graduate of the Cleveland Institute of Art from 1994. When I was very young, I loved to build things like Legos or Tinker Toys. Then when I got old enough to go to elementary school, I drew instead. And it wasn't until I discovered ceramics that I realized, wait a minute, I really like to build stuff. And at the same time, I developed skills as a drawer. So when I started drawing on ceramics, I was like a little light bulb in my head going off. And that happened at CIA. So I think that was one of the most important developments of my career at the CIA as a student there, is putting those two things together. I developed a way of thinking about my own placement and the art and craft world. The thing that I realized was that I was very interested in the concept of duality and otherness. And that concept has really stayed with my work since then. Right out of grad school, I returned to Cleveland and they had a studio space. And I taught part-time at the community college here. I started showing nationally much more. I won some awards, which is really nice. In 2008, I went to the Archie Bray Foundation and did a two-year residency there. I was just working and there were some visitors and someone said, Kevin Snipes, you're famous. I'm like, what? <laughs> Who, me? And I, I hadn't really realized that my work was actually making an impression in the world at large. I decided that that was the moment that I was going to be a full-time artist. I have several pieces at University Hospital's Rainbow and Babies wing, and they were building the wing, and they actually built some niches in the wall and asked me to make work, and that was a really great opportunity. I've been working primarily through solo exhibitions at a few different galleries across the country, and those are great opportunities. 
There's actually sometimes a catalog produced. And so I find that very helpful because the gallery is doing a lot of promotional work and that gets my name out there. I've taught a lot of workshops and I've been a visiting artist at Harvard and RISD, Rhode Island School of Design. I've ended up doing at least one or two a semester. Ideas come from all places and anything it can be family, friends, enemies, sometimes purely made up, sometimes dreams. I have a sketchbook that's always on me. I would say to anyone who wants to study art that it's like any art form, whether it's music or dance or theater or visual arts, that you really have to want to do it. It's not something that you can just do halfway. You have to really be invested in it. You have to kind of give it everything. It's a very competitive field. If you want to be an artist, you really have to live it. It's something that you really have to do 100%. It was great. Um, Kevin Snipes is actually new to all of us here on CSAP Project. His name. I know who Kevin Snipes was. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't know. You, I didn't realize that. I've been a big fan of his for a while. Oh, fantastic. I, I, you know now. <laughs> I, and I, I really enjoy that. I like his work because there's this strong, bold um, narrative, the illustration, the narrative, that kind of... Um, I love how it's applied to something considered a little more delicate and fragile, um, the, the medium of ceramics. Um, I think the combination is really impactful. So, um, and I hadn't, I hadn't heard his name. And then in the course of two weeks, I've now come across his name on three separate occasions in completely unrelated situations. So uh, he's definitely an artist to watch. Um, so thank you, Kina, for bringing that, um, bringing his name to our attention. Um, hey, it's time for a lightning round question for all of us to answer. What is our lightning round question of today? Today, Alyssa Hankey, on jury days like today with nowhere to go, she's in Wisconsin here, I'm sure, jury day, uh, with nowhere to go, I find myself on Netflix. What are your favorite shows to binge during the pandemic? Thank you, Alyssa. Um, I, Mark and I actually just, uh, we just completed um, Sopranos <laughs> after what, it's been 20 years that it's been on. Um, so we just completed that. But if everyone has a pen and paper, the one I would suggest, if you don't know what it is, is it's on Amazon Prime and it's um, Patriot. Okay. And it's beautiful and it's, oh my gosh, we've seen it, I don't know how many times, not a lot of people know about it. That's my little tip for you. If yeah, you're yeah, one. Those tips. Um, <laughs> how about John? What about you? Well, um, we watch a lot of cooking shows. However, during these times lately, we've been wanting to just do comedies and something and we've been holding off, but we are now totally hooked on Schitt's Creek. <laughs> and um, we're, and we're blown to a total. We don't want to go through it because we don't want to. We know we're going to get to the end too fast. But it, every night, it's just like we just want to end the night on something happy and funny, and and just get it, you know, get into a, a fun place. So that's what we've been watching. I, I totally, I totally get it. So um, I've been rewatching every um, season of Curb Your Enthusiasm, and it's pretty, pretty, pretty funny <laughs> but then also and i don't know if this con it is considered a binge i started i watched this movie we watched this movie called my octopus teacher mm -hmm. um and now i've seen it three times like in the last week and it is so good oh my god if you guys haven't seen it you have to have to watch it it's it's absolutely wonderful and what about you chris chris excuse me so uh, I'm a little bit like Beth. We've been we're behind. We don't watch normally when we're on the road. We don't watch a lot of television. So um, we're going back in the archives, and we started watching um, RuPaul's Drag Race. Yes. So we are in um, season two right now of uh, Drag Race. Yes. 
it cracks it, it cracks us up um and i'm learning a lot oh <laughs> right um i'll put that on my list yeah it's fun it's fun yeah i think you would like it Kina. i know i would i would love it <laughs> So uh, speaking of learning a lot, we're learning a lot from one another and from our collectors about other um, artists we should know about um, and presenting them to you through our Seesaw shout outs. So uh, Max, can you uh, show us this week's round of Seesaw shout outs? Hey babe, who should hey. people go look at? Oh, Daryl Thetford from Chattanooga, Tennessee. Daryl Thetford? He is a dear friend and so talented, amazing artist. All right, sounds good. Hi, it's Christy from St. Louis with a shout out to my friend, Melissa Schmidt, who makes everything better with bubbles. Check it out. Hello world, I'm here to introduce Justin Tillett. He's a mixed media artist from Yellow Springs, Ohio. What a beautiful place, what a beautiful man. Yay, that was awesome. Oh, I love I love all three of those. Those are really, really cool. Um, uh, Daryl, I obviously, I miss Daryl. Um, I was his booth neighbor one year and I absolutely love his work. It's um, like made digitally from thousands or hundreds of pictures that he's um, taken over the years. And I think it's pretty ingenious and I love it. It's so modern, but it has that like kind of gritty edge to it. Um, and then uh, Melissa with the bubbles, um, those, I, I haven't seen her in, in several years, but um, I do know that um, those little glass balls, she puts objects in them um, or like even photographs. And, and I actually have wanted one. I saw this uh, earlier and I was like, oh man, I forgot how much I wanted one of those. But this work of Justin's is brand new to me. I've never seen it before and I'm kind of blown away um, by it. And I, I really am like anxious to learn a lot more about it. it um, I, I'm assuming that they're clay because he's a ceramic artist, but um, I'm not sure. Now I want to find out. 
Um, but anyway, thank you guys so, so much um, for, for sending us in um, uh, those shout outs and all those wonderful images. And now I'm super, super honored to be able to uh, announce that we are going to play our featured artists, um, amazing, wonderful video. So uh, grab another drink real quick, sit back and enjoy um, the boy who liked to draw. Hi everyone, I'm John Whipple and I'm talking to you from my studio in Winter Park, Florida. I didn't know what to do with this thing. I just decided I'm going to just, just talk about the journey a little bit. I mean, I've had a few cool, interesting lessons that have helped shape my work and my life also. And I just thought I would talk about those a little bit. Um, so to begin with, when I was young, I was the boy who just liked to draw. I mean, I look back and it's kind of funny. I didn't know a single visual artist. I never saw anybody paint. They were known in our family. But somehow at a very early age, this is what I thought I would do. I never understood what an artist really does, what a career looks like. I just like to draw. Really, when I went to college, that was the first time I had to kind of start thinking about it. Like, what is an artist's career? I decided to go into graphic design because it just seemed to be pointing in some kind of job, maybe? Who knows? I know I didn't know. I just, it's like, made sense. And I went, got my first job, and I began to realize that I didn't really like it that much, you know? I mean, I, enjoy, I enjoyed, like, the problem solving of it. I enjoyed... Um, sort of the constraints and it, you know, gave me a job to do kind of like school. So I kind of like that. And, um, it, it taught me that I like deadlines and that I need a deadline. And, and I did really enjoy getting paid, which is like, you know, good for me. But when I think back, um, I, I think when I was finally beginning to think about doing my own work, trying to get out of all the sort of jobs that I was doing and, it was when I began to study drawing. And when I broke it down into its simplest form, so I could really understand what made a good picture, it really made, uh, it made so much a big difference for me. Because you know, a line on a piece of paper is the root form of all art. Now, when I take this line and I just start drawing, it moves around and it then intersects itself and that turns into shapes. And now I can take these shapes and these lines and inside of that format there, I'm starting to design a picture. Throw in some mark making and that's all you have. Every drawing that's ever been created only uses these three elements, lines, shapes, and marks. So what I began to understand was, wow, this is my job and not an easy one. I've got to translate the whole world into my own unique combination of just these three elements. When Matisse said, there's nothing more difficult for a truly creative painter to paint than a rose. For, before he could do that, he sort of, you have to forget all the other roses. So I think that's what he's talking about. And once I figured that out, everything seemed to make more sense. Like Picasso made more sense, to Kooning, abstract expressionism. How many different ways could I figure out how to paint a rose or a landscape or a face? I found my purpose. Now there were times on this journey that that road got pretty bumpy. I often felt lost, and I, but I remember this pivotal talk I had with my, my teacher at the time, and I just asked him, you know, I, I don't want to go backwards. I'm kind of stuck. Like, can you give me some insight into maybe what I should do next? 
And he took a second and said, Now, I'm not solving that for you. That's yours. But what I'll tell you is, you're going to be such a better artist 100 paintings from now. It was not the answer I was looking for, really, but in retrospect, it's what I needed. To me, it meant that each piece of art moves you ever so slightly forward. I began to see my work as mile markers. That's why I date them so I can chart my growth. But maybe more importantly, was I thought if I had to do the hundred, maybe I could speed up the process, extract more learning from each piece. If I set up each attack as a new problem to solve, start each one differently, try to find something fresh and new to my eyes, maybe not try to fall back on redundant solutions and behaviors, then maybe I would be a better artist. It also taught me to appreciate all my failed attempts and bad paintings. Could they really be that bad if I learned something from them? Just alleviating the idea of good and bad, less judgment, made art making for me so much more enjoyable. It began to feel so much more like I did when I was young. I mean, why did I like to draw? Was it a pat on the back? Or was it something else? What's my child spirit trying to tell me? I think I began to understand when my wife Lynn and I decided to make an art car. We had friends that had made one and they kept going to Houston and raving about it and saying the art car parade there is just awesome and we should make one and we decided to do that. I mean, it, it was an interesting process. We bought an old Cadillac and I just worked on it for years. First couple of years just mostly had paint, but then I started adding sculpture. I mean, I never carved before. The car was sort of the beginnings of my whole sculpture career. And this whole thing was just a completely new tangent. And it was absurdist. I drove it for over eight years. It was a really interesting experience for me. I wasn't comfortable riding and driving it. And I don't even Lynn liked it at first, but occasionally you just start seeing all the kids smiling and people sneaking around looking at it. And, um, and my favorite were always just people that just could not, they could not turn their neck and look at that thing for anything. I mean, it was like my own little social experiment. And when you drove in that, the world is a happy place and you're a child. Now, maybe because the car had no commercial intent, I just felt totally liberated to put any stupid, funny, body, childish thing that came to my mind. And I love that. There was just something about that was so freeing. I, even now when I make my artwork, I want to feel that way. I want to be able to laugh, find the humor, just relish the joy of using my hands. I want to feel that way when I was just a boy drawing on the dining room table. I sometimes question this life and what I want from it. Can I let go of my ego and my competitiveness just to enjoy the journey? How much is wrapped up in me wanting to be successful and making a living? When I look back, what will I remember? What will I be most proud of? Will it be the artwork I've created? Or the crazy times? Uh, the great friends? Oh, the, the long nights partying and 
the wonderful dinners and man, our just our traveling band of misfits. Isn't crafting an artful life part of our body of work? And doesn't the playfulness and the joy in our life become magically translated and reflected through our artwork? I mean, I don't, I believe in that kind of magic. It feels like magic to me when I'm just driving and an idea just comes out of nowhere. It feels like magic to me when I sit down and six hours are gone. Now you could probably find science explains it all, but I'm gonna choose a world where I feel like I have this transformative ability to make something out of nothing. Where I can turn an idea, a mere thought into a physical reality. Where I can find beauty in all the debris where I can rummage through my collection of rusty and discarded objects and create something that can make me cry or laugh. I choose a world where I can bring anything back to life just by asking, what can I make with that? When Picasso said, it took me four years to paint like Raphael, but a lifetime to paint like a child. He helped me understand the real artistic journey. It's not about learning techniques or craftsmanship or getting in museum and gallery shows. To me, it's understanding that all of those carefully laid mile markers are on a road that isn't straight but one with a slow curving arc back to my beginning. A beginning when there was no right or wrong, bad or good, should or shouldn't. Just a place with less judgment where play and joy and magic exist. For most of my life, I thought about art as the work I created, unaware of the journey. But I've learned more about who I am, what I love, how I think, how I see the world than I ever could have imagined. All the doors that have been opened, the roads we got to travel, the kindred spirits we've been lucky to meet are all because of this journey. I feel now that the faint whisperings of that little boy have grown a little bit louder. His message to me of why I love to draw a little bit clearer. Can I, even if I'm aware of this journey, be able to let go of my ego and all my hardened adult motivations just to play in this world? Man, I'm trying. Thank you so much for watching. To get more info on any available work, please go to my store or check out my Instagram and Facebook page. And thanks again. I watched it half a dozen times this week so that I wouldn't cry. So I wouldn't cry tonight. And I still cried tonight. I know, me too. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. And yeah, no, that's rough. Um, hey, listen, you guys, if you have any questions or comments for John, make sure you go ahead and and, um, and throw them in there so we can uh, uh, we can grill him. But. Um, well, we've already we've already gotten a fellow artist saying uh, thanks, John. I really needed that message. 
John, that was incredibly profound. Thank you from Pam Caden. I, I yeah. think just so you know, John, can you hear us at the moment? Oh, so many people. yeah, John, that was beautiful. There's, they're coming in. Oh, so many coming in, I can't read. But so let, let's talk about something that has nothing maybe to do with your art. And it's that hair that you used to have when you were doing your car. So it seems like at the moment. Uh, I thought it might have been a wig. <laughs> it's not, it seems no. like at the moment, possibly John can't hear us. We can hear him. I don't know if, if there's a way to tell him we can hear him. Oh, okay. Well, we'll just talk. Well, yeah, we'll just talk about him in front of his back then. Oh, we had this. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no. I know that um, as we met a little earlier, there's a point that he kind of, the microphone kind of popped back in. So let's hope that's going to be the case. Um, maybe we can get uh, someone texting him some questions <laughs> pop in and, and answer them. Um, uh, John, if you can see the comments over in the right, maybe we can put questions to you over there. But in, in the meantime, um, John talks about the lessons that uh, he learns or the lesson that he learned from his teacher. And I can also say that um, I, I learned a lesson oh, from I hear John. John. Um, I can't hear. Oh, no, I, now I hear you. You can't hear us? Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I can't hear you guys. <laughs> I missed it all. <laughs> I'm sure it was fine. <laughs> I don't know why my audio is off. Hey, well, this is amazing that we can do this anyway, so, you know. Well, let me tell you this amazing story. When I was between work, um, when stopped making the materials. Um, I, learned, <laughs> I learned a great story from John or a great lesson from John. Uh, just like he said, he had a teacher pass one on to him, but I uh, had lost my materials that I was working with and I started to make new work and it wasn't really uh, going together very well. And um, John said, you know, this work might not be the work, but be sure that you keep moving forward. Yeah, right. absolutely. Like, this is just a step towards the next work. Uh, and so I, I think we lost, we, we, he exited and he's going to try to come back in to see if it will like work a little bit of uh, mojo. On, so on there. Scott, Scott Hildebrandt asked, uh, where is the Cadillac now? So we did get to hear, we did get to hear that story earlier this week. So when the, um, when the car started misbehaving, um, and it wasn't uh, workable anymore. They decided what could be the better, the best send off for this big old Cadillac art car. And so they entered it in a demolition derby. <laughs> I know it makes me, I, Max and I were talking about that yesterday and Max thinks, it, you know, that's so profound and absolutely that all this incredible stuff was just made just to be destroyed. But I, when I saw that again tonight, I was thinking like, if I could find where that was and dig through the trash of that, <laughs> like I would totally take, I was like, did they take the stuff off or some of the like really amazing sculptures? And I'm, I'm really glad that, that, uh, that they did the art car because that's when he first started making sculptures. And uh, we have, we're lucky enough to, to have two of his sculptures. And um, it, I, I mean, it just, I love them every day. I love them every day that I, that I look at them and I really, really cherish them. Um, and there's one of his sculptures got away too that I didn't, I didn't buy it was the very first show uh, that I that I saw them that I met them at, and uh, like we talk about it all the time. You know, remember that piece? And of course, he sold it. You know, because it was amazing. Yeah, I mean, John with his work. So it's the boy who likes to draw, but I mean. The, something that wasn't shown quite as much um, in the video was these gorgeous sculptures that Kina, you just mentioned that you have a couple. Um, he does sculptures as well. And when you uh, get to know his work and you get to see um, the how he uses painting, how he creates sculpture, and then kind of there's this beautiful Mary in between where he'll take portraits and 
cut them up or put them on wood block. And they're a, this beautiful um, combination of two completely different mediums um, that just falls right in between. Um, can't and, they're, and they have that depth to them. And th those pieces absolutely blow me out of the water. But, but I think the thing for me, for John, is every time, you know, a, a, like a few months will go by and I'll see, like, he's made something completely new. It's not like he just keeps doing, you know, like I keep making little people and, you know, hopefully they get a little bit more animated, but I'm just like, how do you think of this stuff? Like, it's just, it's just a whole new thing every time I see him. Um, so I'm for sure missing, missing the shows and, and, and missing to get to see that. So this is, this is pretty awesome for us. I'm sorry that we're having an audio issue. Yes. I, can you hear me? We can. We can, can you hear you? Us? I can hear you. I can't. I, I can't see. I can't see. <laughs> oh, I kind of like. I, I, just, I was letting you go on. I, I, you, I just let you go on. I was enjoying that. <laughs> that's awesome. That, that's actually kind of awesome. It's a little bit mysterious there. He's like in a closet or something. <laughs> I say, take advantage of it. Let's get a question out to John. Yeah. <laughs> oh, now Scott Hildebrandt, uh, Mr. Christmas, wants to make a little, um, a little memento, like a, a, a diorama of the demolition derby. Oh, that'd be nice. <laughs> I know, that's so cool. So John, I was I was surprised to hear that you didn't have any artist um, in your in your family or in your surrounding growing up because now it seems like such a family affair. So you were the first, and then um, inspired more of your family to create art, or how'd that go? Um, well, my mom was was an artist, but she was not really like like you know know her today. But she she played guitar. And she taught music and, she, and, and they were very supportive of the arts, but I didn't, there was never any, I never, I never saw anybody drawing or painting. I never, I don't think I ever watched anybody paint until I was in maybe in college or something. You know what I mean? I never saw a professional or I never saw anybody making artwork or making a living by it, you know? So it was kind of, I just, it was kind of a long learning curve for me. I think I, it took me a long time to figure out how to make a living. You know, I didn't really know where to go. I didn't have any real tools in the beginning. Right, and you, I think we, uh, there was such a parallel to I, to my um, journey as an artist, I, I think to, um, to a lot of ours, um, where you kind of talked about how you knew you liked to do this, this is just what you did, and you didn't know what that job, what that career could even be. You just knew you liked to draw, and you that's what you did, um, which was the same thing. I went to school. I had no idea what careers out there th that there would be. Um, can you just talk about that corporate end, that corporate side? How long were you there, and did what did you get out of it? Well, I, we, I did a lot of great jobs. I'm not really dissing it too much. I learned a lot. I, I worked at... Um, Oh, I, our science museum. I did all their big displays. I worked at Nickelodeon and at Disney. I got to go. Um, I worked at some ad agencies and did logos. And I mean, all of those are pretty good jobs, really. You know, it just that after a while, it just feels like you're you, you just want to do your you, you're just motivated to do something else, you know, <clears throat> and you just feel like you're always working for somebody else and, and you're not really um, solving anything like what you're supposed to be doing with your own work. And and let me ask you this about um you said so you said you studied uh you studied with a teacher is that after was that after school was that what like when did you start studying with an art teacher um it was it was excuse me it was um after I got out of college um I had been working a few years and then I just happened to see this ad in the paper for to study with this professor from that ran Parsons he was the head of illustration and I was like oh my god. I, I so need that. Yeah. <laughs> and I never really got to go to a really good art school. I always wanted to. I just couldn't afford it. And so this was my opportunity. And then and then I once I started studying with him, it was like everything just kind of changed. It was just sort of the mentorship I needed. So I was very fortunate. 
So mm -hmm. somebody here wants us to uh, have you talk more about it. it uh, I'm not sure who this is, but um, talk more about moving away from self judgment and the discovery part, which which I I thought was really awesome. It's one of the things that was like making me. <laughs> Well, you know, there's a catch 22 in art sometimes. The harder you try, the worse it gets because you lose all the spot and every, all the freedoms that make it good are crushed by your self analysis, you know? And so the more that you learn that lesson, like if you do something really dumb and you just think you're laughing and you're playing and all of a sudden, and then you go, ah, this is the stupidest thing. And it's the first thing that sells. And it just reinforces that, man, if I, you're in the right headspace and you're, and you're really enjoying what you're doing, regardless of what it is, it gets right through that piece of work and people respond to it. You know, and if you keep hitting, doing the same thing over and over again, sometimes it just gets a little dead. And, you know, and you have to kind of move. For me, I just learned that lesson a long time ago, just to just have fun. And, and, um, and that's when you're just, when you're happy making artwork, I think the work is good. Mm -hmm. It shows. It shows yeah. when you, right, when you're uninhibited and when you, when you love it, when you paint for yourself and not trying to figure out what somebody else wants. And, um, and, and that idea of beauty and all the debris, I love that line. Um, Cause it's what I'm drawn to when, you know, with other people's work, I find, um, where are you keeping all that debris? Because you've got that one picture. It seemed like you have a lot of it. Huh? Yeah. Well, that first, the, the one with most of it was my old studio, thank God. My, yeah. new, my new studio, I had to like pack it all. And so a lot of it had to go into bins. And then I've kept them more in bins now. And I have a huge wall of all my stuff. And um, sometimes it's overwhelming to have that much stuff. But... Um, I mean, I used to say the hunt was as fun as, you know, the hunt for all that stuff was just so much fun. And we go traveling and, you know, that's where you go. You go and hit every market, every, you know, anywhere you could find something, you know, that was part of the adventure. Oh, my gosh. I can remember some amazing days after shows of all of these vans showing up at a junk store and us about knocking one another down <laughs> to be the first one in the door. Right. Because everyone was hunting the same junk. Paul Andrews and Kemper and and the fight when you got when when it was a good piece and everybody wanted it. What are you going to do with that? <laughs> what, do you what are you going to do with it? Yeah. yeah, the show and tells even afterwards. You know, it's like, oh, okay, put it on the table. Let's show it everyone you got. And, you know, yeah, I love those times. So when you have those great treasures, John, is it hard to put them into a work um, or, you know, in case a better opportunity comes for that piece or? Uh, sometimes, you know, you know, you have a couple like are just gold and, you know, right. and you're kind of waiting because you just know it's such a good piece. But eventually you just have to, you know, it's going to have to, you might as well do something with it because, you know, I also have great gold that's been sitting on my shelf for over years, you know, so I guess if you, you, you see something great in it, you just do it and mm -hmm. let it go. Don't do let it become too precious, right? Yeah, yeah. Do you get intimidated by any of those, the, you know, those really special pieces where um, you just think, oh, it's nope, that's too good. I got to put it to the side again. No? Not well, maybe in the beginning. I'm, but yeah, there is a couple where I spent a lot too much money on it, and that even made it even you know oh no you know I don't 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 screw it up right too soon. But normally once I start going into it, I then it it just becomes another piece and a part, and I don't think about it anymore. Nice. Someone also asks, um, you mentioned problem solving as a sort of challenge. Can you talk about that creative problem solving that you enjoy? Well, I, I would say, um, like I was saying in the, in the beginning, I started realizing that to make a good, you know, a new picture, you had to kind of give yourself a new premise or something to make your line shapes and marks different. So that's an idea. And then you have to kind of come up with these kind of original ideas all the time to maneuver your graphics to make them new and different. So it, really, it's about the idea that generates those things that becomes interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I, I love the way that you bring that same energy, that same creative problem solving to uh, everything in your entire life. I mean, talking about it's not just the, the objects that you're making, right? But it's that same creative problem solving. Um, and uh, Max and I were, ta were talking about this uh, the other day too, because I have uh, like what it's like literally one of my most prized possessions is this incredibly beautiful painting um, that John, they had a flood in their house and they had parquet tiles and he, you know, most people, yeah, we, we take up the old tile and we throw it away, but not John, <laughs> he turned them over and they had been applied with like tar and he put them together and made all these paintings. And like, I saw, I mean, I remember when I saw this painting, I was like, <gasps> and I was by myself in uh, Kansas City and I was calling my husband going, I'm gonna buy this painting. <laughs> And uh, I, I know that that painting is going to be hanging in my bedroom, whatever bedroom I have for the rest of my life. And I just, it's one of my biggest treasures. Something's, something's coming in here from a. <laughs> oh, gosh. That's, That's our John Whipple. Oh my so God. Here. Awesome. <gasps> hard to do. I love that. So Mark is below trying to pass <laughs> into the setting. Um, yeah. Uh, John, where can people who are interested in seeing nope. more of you? That's not, <laughs> not break my John Whipple. Um, where are people who are interested in seeing more of your work? Where can we send them? Where can they go? Oh, well, I have a my Facebook page under John Whipple and then my Instagram is J Whipple Art, you know, so, um, and I have a shop and it's, you'll see the, um, it's, you'll see the link in our, in the thing, cause I'm using actually Lynn's store. I'm, I'm part of her store. And so instead of just, you know, just go to the link and you'll, you'll find uh, all, a lot of my available work right now. And I put it on there and, um, you know, I'd love for everyone to take a look at it. Yeah, Kyle's going to drop those links over in the chat, whether you're on uh, YouTube or Facebook. Um, they're in the in the chat. Tiny, tiny dot URL slash John Whipple art is the store. And John, honestly, um, thank you so much for being part of this episode. I, I kind of want to end this with something Audrey Heller wrote in the comments, because I think it's really beautiful. It says, all of John's amazing portraits to have him be a black square on the screen. <laughs> Um, and that's so that hilarious. Hilarious. Yeah. amazing portraits, beautiful work. And a really the, the video spoke to us. Um, and that's why we were all um, we've been misty for a week, I think. So thank you, John. Thank you so much. But of course, well, this everything personal, we make this amazing. I, I, red -faced. I think maybe uh, Max said he's just too red. <laughs> oh, oh. Well, one one more question from Pam Caden. Yes, the whole episode stays available both on YouTube and on Facebook. On YouTube, it takes it just a little while for it to process after we post it live. Uh, so we'll be back up there in about an hour. If you're on Facebook, you can watch it again immediately. Um, so yes, we've we've watched it half a dozen times, and it's. I need to watch it uh, at least that. Oh, no, me too. Me too. I was going to take notes actually the next time. Right. Yeah. The, the other funny note is, um, is Paul Andrews saying that this is the best behaved he's ever seen you, John. Thank you, John. We love you. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, guys. All right, so um, after that, let's um, actually take a look now as we look to the future as to what's coming up um, on our future episodes here on Seesaw Project. November 5th, uh, it's an episode titled Living with Art, showcasing artists and artwork we use in our daily lives. On November 19th is Helen Gottlieb. Um, as a printmaker, Helen's approach to her subject matter produces a body of work you certainly don't want to miss. December 3rd is our holiday show as we are, we're fast approaching that time of the year, guys. Yikes. 
uh, to round out our season, we look forward to Scott Hildebrand, AKA Mr. Christmas, uh, building super detailed, intricate sculptures and Mr. Christmas around Christmas, kind of a no brainer, right? Yeah. And uh, thank you guys. Thank you guys for um, for tuning in and for watching us, um, which is is, you know, we absolutely love all the comments. Um, there's many ways that you could like help support us. Uh, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, like us and follow us uh, Seesaw Project on Facebook. Um, if you're in the position to uh, help us defray the costs, of producing this uh we have a venmo that you would you can contribute to and that we'd be we'd be thrilled we'd be thrilled um if you are interested in um sponsoring uh an episode you could give us you know give us a ring um and massages cooking <laughs> recipes on my like, uh house cleaning i don't know i don't know any any way we really appreciate um, any help you can give us. Yeah. And we've got uh, lots of people to thank tonight that have contributed to this episode. Signe and Gena Grishavinko for a shout out, Christy Score from St. Louis and Carl Nilsson for their shout out videos. Steph, the ever uh, cheery Steph Keelan, Benjamin Beamer for his great video. Lynn Whipple, Mark Winter, and Kyle Dahlquist behind the scenes in all of our homes. Max Crow, our producer, we couldn't do it without him. And of course, all of our collectors that uh, keep us making work and all of the generous donors that have helped defray the cost of producing the show. And some more thanks to, um, to artists you saw today on the show, uh, Kevin Snipes. He's at Hollow Fingers on Instagram. There's Daryl Thetford, darylthetford.com. Melissa Schmidt at melissaschmidtstudio.com. And Justin Tillett at jtillett on Instagram. Don't forget our featured artist. Thank you, John. John Whipple. He's at jwhippleart on Instagram. Or you can go to the tinyurl.com slash johnwhippleart. And don't forget about us. If you want to see more of our work, uh, you can see Beth Bajarski's work at bethbajarski.com. My work, Kina Crow at kinacrow.com. And the wonderful photography of Chris Dahlquist at chrisdahlquist.com. And I also want to say really quick, uh, someone asked here are, if the past episodes are available to watch, and they absolutely are. Um, you can watch every single one of, of our episodes so far on YouTube um, and Facebook on our Facebook page as well. So thank you guys so much for coming. And uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry we lost John's cute face, <laughs> but at least we got his cute art. <laughs> his awesome art. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thanks everyone for coming. Look forward to seeing you for the next one. Thanks. See you guys. Yeah. Bye.